this was the job of also Imam al Hussein to accept in the caravan of Imam al Hussein. When Umayyah had corruption, they tell you we don't care about their corruption. We care about of Rasulullah, the ones that put themselves in and the majority of Aba Abdullah. the religion of Islam and therefore they are praised. And when you tell them, A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. The Umayyad dynasty or the family of Umayyah or Bani Umayyah claimed the position of Khilafah of Rasulullah and governed the community of Muslims for 91 years. This dynasty took over the leadership position of the Muslim Ummah from the 41st year after the Hijrah of Rasulullah from Mecca to Medina and continued the reign until the year 132 after the Hijrah. This dynasty was founded and established by Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan ibn Harb ibn Umayyah who took the position of Khilafah after the truce and the peace treaty that he had with the grandson of Rasulullah, As-Sibt al-Akbar, Al-Imam Hassan al-Mujtaba alayhi salam However, Muawiyah's power and authority did not begin in the 41st year after the Hijrah. But it began almost 20 years prior to that. When he was appointed as the governor to an important territory within the Islamic Empire, Sham. Sham, which consisted of Syria, Lebanon, Palestine, Jordan. Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan ibn Harb ibn Umayyah was appointed as the governor of Sham by the second caliph Umar ibn al-Khattab and by the time the Khilafah reached him and by the time he died he had been in position of power for 40 years Muawiyah had a great deal of time in those 40 years to establish his power and authority and to prepare and pave the way for the Islamic Caliphate to be given to his children and his progeny and therefore turning the Khilafah of Rasulullah into a dynasty. And this family, the family of Bani Umayyah or the Umayyad dynasty has been examined and analyzed and studied by Muslim historians, by Muslim thinkers, by Muslim authors, by Muslim scholars, by non-Muslims, Westerners, and of course, indeed, they remain to be a controversial <coughs> dynasty. However, those who praise them and those who glorify them and those who honor them will tell you that the reason why we glorify them and we honor them and we respect them is because they expanded the Islamic territory. They had a powerful army. 
They had a powerful navy. They brought glory and might to Islam and to the Muslims. And indeed, in the time of Hisham, the 10th Caliph of the Umayyad dynasty, Islam had reached Turkey, China, India, South Africa, and even all the way to France. An undefeatable army with lots of glory and might. So much money was pouring into the Islamic Empire, into the Islamic treasury. So many people were taken as prisoners of war and turned into slaves so they can serve the Islamic Empire. While if you compare him to the time of Ali ibn Abi Talib, there wasn't an inch of expansion to the Islamic territory. There wasn't one person who was taken as a prisoner of war and turned into a slave so that he would then benefit and serve the religion of Islam. So to them, this is the greatest of evidence to their ongoing endeavor to serve the religion of Islam and therefore they are praised. And when you tell them, but Bani Umayyah had corruption, they tell you we don't care about their corruption. We care about the fact that they gave us such results. Yes, Ali ibn Abi Talib may have been pious, but look at his results. His result is that he did not add a single inch of expansions to the Islamic territories. And of course, this is an extremely important discussion and a vital one for us to understand the philosophy of Islam. Is Islam a religion or is it an empire? Is Islam a faith that must reside in the hearts and the minds and the souls of people? Or is it a political system and a political party that is supposed to expand and rule and govern the world? When Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam was appointed and declared the last and the final prophet of God. He was not declared as a prophet so that he would establish dynasties and empires and create an abundance of wealth and the greatest army. But Rasulullah came to perfect the akhlaq of people, the morality of people. To create a connection and a bond between them and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is the job of the Prophet and Anbiya. And Rasulullah was constantly reminded of that task. That Ya Rasulullah, follow the footsteps of Abraham. Follow the footsteps of Musa. Follow the footsteps of Isa. Prophets and messengers who came prior to you. And what was the task of a prophet like Ibrahim? Did Ibrahim declare a government? Did Ibrahim establish a political party? Or was Ibrahim there to introduce, to introduce people to Allah and through Allah to give them morality, to give them akhlaq, to give them ethics? To show them the true essence of the merciful God. One day, the Prophet Ibrahim, uh, the Prophet Musa, he was a shepherd. So he went and he saw another shepherd that was speaking, and he was saying, I wish you were here so I can comb your hair. And I can take the lice out of your hair. And I can massage your feet. And I can give you a bath. 
tuck you in bed, spoil you, love you. So Musa said to the shepherd, who are you speaking to? There's nobody here. He says, I'm speaking to God. He says, you're speaking to God? God doesn't have hair. God doesn't have a body. You're going to end up, what are, you, what are you talking about? This is blasphemy. You don't know God. You don't understand God. So the shepherd who was illiterate, this is all he knew. This was the amount of his understanding towards religion and God was ashamed. Here's Musa, Kalimullah, telling him that you don't know God. So this man went silent. Days later, Jibra'il came to Musa, O oh Musa, Allah is displeased with you. Allah is not happy with what you've done, Musa. So Musa says, Ya Allah, Ya Jibra'il, what have I done? What did I do? He says, for 40 years, Allah enjoyed the conversation of this man. Allah enjoyed the presence of this man, the dua of this man. But for the past three days, this man has gone silent and Allah misses him in his munajat. Musa, your job was to teach him not to sever the ties between him and Allah. You're supposed to connect people to Allah. You're not supposed to disconnect Allah with his creation. The job of the messenger or Musa is to bring people closer to the Almighty God. And this is exactly the job of Rasulullah, to bring people closer to the Almighty God. This is the job of those who follow the footsteps of Rasulullah, the ones that put themselves in the position of being the ambassadors and representatives of Rasulullah, to bring people closer to the religion of Islam, to Allah the Almighty. And this was the job of also Imam al Hussein, And this was his task. And this is what he was trying to achieve. And this also must be the job of the member of Imam al Hussein, And the Imam Bargas. And the Masajid. And the Majalis of Aba Abdullah. To bring people closer to Allah. Not to judge them. Not to... Become like the police of God treating them like the canine unit. If they make a mistake, then we are vocal in front of others and putting them down and humiliating them. What we learn from the 10th of Muharram is there was a criminal by the name of Hur. Ibn Yazid al-Riyahi who intercepted the caravan of Imam al Hussein, which led to the misery and the massacre of Ashura and moments before the massacre of Ashura he came to Imam al Hussein asking for forgiveness Imam al Hussein knew that this man is guilty and he knows he is guilty he's pleading guilty in front of the court of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in front of the ultimate judge. He's pleading guilty and he is ashamed of what he has done. Imam al Hussein did not put more shame on him. Imam al Hussein didn't say, Shame on you, Hur. You come to me now? You know what will happen to us tomorrow? No, Imam al Hussein knew that this man now needs a hand to lift him, to help him. To give, him, to give him inspiration. So Imam al Hussein says to him, Tubta Allahu alayk. And sometimes we find that in our communities, this is the situation of the youth. Somebody who doesn't wear hijab, somebody who, for example, comes to the Husseiniya or the masjid or the Imam Barga not dressed properly or has had a past. Or for example, if you go through the media, social media and there are pictures, you find things that are not so Islamic. 
So as soon as they come and they try to attend the house of Imam al Hussein, we point fingers at them. What is this guy doing here? Why is he here? Does he really think that Imam al Hussein will guide him or help him? Where is Imam al Hussein in this guy's life? And those people are discouraged and they leave. And sometimes they never return. What we understand from the religion of Islam, brothers and sisters, going back to my topic, is that Islam didn't come to become an empire. Islam didn't come to have an army. Islam didn't come to have invasions and force people by the sword. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Holy Quran and an ayah that all Muslims know says, La ikraha fi deen. There is no compulsion in religion. If you force people, then as soon as the force is gone, whatever they're forced in, whether it's an act, whether it's a feeling, whether it's a belief, will also be gone. Can you force people to love you? They may pretend that they love you by force. Can you force people to pretend they hate somebody? Yes, they may pretend for you because of the force. Exactly what Saddam did to the community of the followers of Ahlul Bayt in Iraq. For 30 years, he forced them to go away from Ahlul Bayt and Imam Al Hussein and to forget Hussein and the tragedy of Hussein and to stop their right to give up their identity as the Shia of Hussein and the Shia of Ali ibn Abi Talib and he killed them and he massacred them. And he waged wars on his own neighbor, the neighboring country which was also the Shia population so that he fights this madhab, the call of Aba Abdullah al Hussein. But as soon as he collapsed and his regime collapsed, what happens? You see millions of people Millions of people marching towards Aba Abdullah al Hussein. As soon as the force was not there, people come back to their realities. That is why another group of Muslims, another sect of Islam, will tell you that we are not proud of Bani Umayyah. And we are not fond of The 91 years of the governance and the reign of the Umayyad dynasty. Why would we, we would rather have a Jew or a Christian or a non-Muslim lead us and to govern us than a Muslim who is only Muslim by name. Why? Because this Muslim was the one who killed the Sahaba of Rasulullah. Maybe if a Jew or a Christian or a non-Muslim had assumed the Khilafah or the leadership position of the Muslims, he would not have killed the Sahaba of Rasulullah. Not only the Sahaba, but the family and the progeny of Rasulullah. Murdered and slain. Not only that, the killing of Hamalatul Quran, the killing of the ones who had memorized the Quran. You know, the job of those individuals was, and their presence in the Islamic Empire was extremely of importance. Why? Because Quran was not yet written in so many copies. There weren't so many people who were literate to sit down and copy the Quran. There weren't photocopy machines then. So we had people called Hamalatul Quran, the ones who memorized the Quran, carried the Quran in their chests. The killing of Hamalatul Quran. The raid of the holy city of Medina, the masjid of Rasulullah, the raid of Mecca and the destruction of the Kaaba. This all happened by the Muslim caliph. We don't want such a caliph. I don't care if he took Islam and the Islamic Empire to the moon. 
The core of Islam, which is the morals and the principles of ethics, were forgotten. This is the difference. This is the clash, brothers and sisters. If you want to know the real clash between the Umayyah version of Islam and the true essence of Islam, the Islam that has not been tampered with, the Islam that has not been distorted, this is the ultimate difference. Clash of power, wealth, with morality and ethics. And yes, indeed, as soon as they took power, Muawiyah turned the Khilafah into a kingdom. He was the first Khalifa. And when I say Khalifa, brothers, don't think that I believe that he is the Khalifa. Please don't get me wrong. We're talking history here. We're talking to all the Muslims. My aim today when I discuss those lectures is not just for you brothers to understand Islamic history. Or for even people watching online who are from our madhab and the followers of Ahlul Bayt to know Islamic history better. No, my aim with your help and with your assistance hopefully we can allow those who have a clean heart, a pure heart, those Muslims who truly want to find the truth to know this history so they can ponder and think about this history we're not here once again I'm not saying we're not here to disrespect anyone or to discredit them we are here to speak history and the truth he when he became the Khalifa the Khalifa up until then didn't have something called a throne an arsh He never wore a crown, but now when Muawiyah bin Abi Sufyan became the Khalifa, he was the first pers person to bring into the house of the Khilafah the throne. And he sat on the throne, and he was seen to be like a king of the Romans or the king of the Persians, and he acted the sim similarly. And the way that he behaved and the way that he had a lavish lifestyle. And today, you may ask me, Sayyidna, does this relate to me today? Or is Muawiyah a part of history? He's long gone. I tell you, no, he's still alive. Why? Because today you find people who claim to be the defenders of Islam. The ones who represent the religion of Islam. The ones who print the Qur'ans and the ones who are the custodians of the Kaaba. And the servants of the Haramain. Let me ask you. When... The civil wars happened in Syria and the refugees started fleeing and Iraq starting, started fleeing from Muslim countries and Muslim lands. Who opened their doors for them? Muslim countries? Who felt sorry for the children who were drowning in the sea? Muslim children's? Muslim, fa Muslim governments? You saw some footage of the child who had drowned. And they picked up his dead body, three-year-old Syrian kid. Is he not a Muslim? Is he not a human being? Does he have no honor? Or that seven-year-old boy who his mother and father and family were killed and he was carrying his mother's bag with him 
had not ate for three days. They found him in the middle of the desert. Didn't the world see this? Didn't the custodian of the Haramayn not see this? Didn't all the Arab countries not see this? Shame on them. They call themselves Muslims. Who opened their doors for them? The European nations. The non-Muslims. And brothers and sisters, we live in a country that's not Islam, that's not Muslim. We live in the West. Some people, they say, we wish we lived in Islamic countries. Why do you lie? What do you mean you wish you would? Go, live. Go, leave. It's, you know, five minutes, you book your flights online and you move. Don't tell me I wish I lived in Muslim countries. Nobody wishes they lived in Muslim countries. Everybody wishes to live in the West. Far away from Islamic countries. Why? Because today, if we lived in Islamic countries, we would not be able to congregate here with a peace of mind. Any minute there could be a bomb, a, a person who does a drive-by shooting or detonates a, a car bomb next to an Imam Barga. In some countries, if you are the followers of Ahl al-Bayt, it's a crime. If you go to Vegas and you gamble and fornicate and drink, you go back to those Islamic lands, they tell you, welcome back home. Did you have fun? Good. But if you go to Karbala to visit Imam al Hussein, they tell you, come. Why did you go to Iraq, Karbala? Huh? They'll take your passport for six months. And throw you out of your job. And give you a hard time as a citizen of that country. Why? Because their crime is that they visited the grandson of Rasulullah. So don't tell me I wish I lived in Islamic countries. Nobody wishes that. And the reality is, in such nights we have to discuss an extremely important notion, a misunderstanding. We have to erase some of the mistakes in our minds. Reinstall new information. Update the program here. The software here needs an update sometimes. And the update takes place in the month of Muharram. We tend to follow Islam by name. So I tell my kids, please, if you want to have friends, have Muslim friends. So I ask him, what's your friend's name? He says, my, my friend's name is Azgar, my friend's name is Ali, my friend's name is Muhammad, my friend's name is Amr, whatever it may be, good. Please, son, only Muslim kids, huh? But we don't ask, what are those Muslim kids teaching your kids? What is their akhlaq? What is their morality? As long as he is called a Muslim, he looks like a Muslim. As long as, for example, they understand that what halal food is. Things like this, silly little things, and we forget the bigger picture. Or we sometimes prefer Muslims above non-Muslims because of their identity. So a friend has to be a Muslim, not a non-Muslim. But I don't care what this guy does. He's a Muslim, but I don't care what his akhlaq is. How he is with his family. How he is as an employer. How he is as an employee. Is he a good employer? Is he a fair employer? Is he a kind employer? Or he no, he's a tyrant. Or as an employee, is he a cheat? Is he a fake? Is he lying to his boss every day? We don't care, but he has to be Muslim. Islam, brothers and sisters, teaches us to separate from names and titles 
and look for the essence and the hearts of people. Rasulullah tells his community of believers. He says, "Inna Allah yanzuru li qulubikum wa la yanzuru li suwarikum." Allah looks at your hearts. He does not look at your exterior. He does not look at your titles. He does not look at your names. But Allah looks at your heart. If your heart is pure, then Allah loves you. But if you have the greatest of titles and the most beautiful of appearance, but the inside is rotten, Allah does not love you. Let's make that clear to our children. And that is why I believe in the West and here in the United States of America, there are Muslims, not by name, but by morality and ethics. And that is the majority of your neighbors and your friends and your co-workers. Muslims by akhlaq, Muslims by practice, Muslims by principles, but his name is John, his name is Michael. An average Joe. A person who does not lie, a person who is kind to you as an employer. You go and you tell him, I want to go and do the pilgrimage. He says, fine, go. I have a problem at home, I need a break. Fine, take the break. I know individuals who their homes were being taken away from them in the recession. Non-Muslims, their neighbors came to them and says, take this money, $20,000. I don't want it. I just want you to stay here as a neighbor to me. I don't care if you're Muslim. I know, and you know, and you've heard, and you have seen of non-Muslim doctors who travel to impoverished parts of the world, treating people for free. Doing surgeries for free, taking medicine for free. I know millionaires. And you know, and you've heard of celebrities, millionaires and billionaires who travel the world to build schools and homes for orphans. This is Islam by practice. But then you come to a, a Muslim by name, not by practice. Wallahi. They will accumulate the millions and buy the mansions and the most exotic of vehicles to, and take the best vacations, but you tell him donate to the masjid, he'll give you $500 of that. And if it's anything more, you have to announce his name 24 times. La ilaha illallah. How many of who how many of you have, have heard of millionaires, non-Muslim millionaires who have donated 90% of their wealth, 50% of their wealth, 60% of their wealth? Huh? How many of Muslims have you heard who have donated 90% of their wealth? So don't tell me he's a Muslim by name. Look for people by Muslim by identity, Muslim by practice. I know people who tell me my boss is a Muslim. I try to go to Hajj, he doesn't let me. I try to go to Ziyara, he doesn't let me. I have a family problem. I try to take my paycheck a month early, he doesn't give me. This is the Muslim employer. I know Muslims who email me, Sayyid, my employer is Muslim. He tells me if I, wear, if I wear the hijab, he'll throw me out of the job. But there you find others who are not Muslim. The day that a woman, a Muslim woman decides to wear the hijab, the other woman in her company and around her will wear the hijab to support her. To tell her you're not alone here. So we live in a country, brothers and sisters, let's not have double standards. Let's find the good human beings, the good souls, befriend them, have good relationships with them, and let's be honest and good citizens of this country. Because this country has opened its doors to us. It's welcomed us. It's given us freedom and a future for your children. 
And then it's time for you to give back to this country. Don't just take, 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 take. No, we, we have to give back also. You have to have a sense of responsibility. This is what we understand from the examination of the Umayyad dynasty. But Islam was left as a name. But its essence was gone. And some people ask, Sayyidna, why is it that Muslim countries, there must be something wrong with Islam. Because look at Muslim countries. There is so much poverty. There is so much corruption. They are never democratic. There are so many people in prison. Why? There must be something wrong with Islam. But now look at the West. Look at the US. Freedom. Democracy, welfare, equality. So there must be something wrong with the religion of Islam. No. This is why we are re-examining Islam between distortion and originality. So we find what went wrong. Tomorrow if you are asked by a non-Muslim, by a non-Muslim you now know how to respond. You know what is wrong with Islam today? It's because of this and this and this and this and this. And we've ended up here. So we can have a better explanation for ourselves and our children. And when we examine the Umayyad dynasty, brothers and sisters, we should not examine them from the year 41 after Hijrah when Muawiyah became a Khalifa. That is not the correct way of examining them. The correct way of examining Bani Umayyah is from the 11th year after the Ba'thah, before the migration of Rasulullah to Medina. Surah Al-Isra, the ayah that I began my lecture with. And I want you to give me your undivided attention. And the 11th or 12th year after the Ba'thah, right before the migration of Mecca to Medina, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam went into the Isra. And Allah sends an entire chapter, Surah Al-Isra in the Qur'an, true? There Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks of a dream that Rasulullah had. And Allah says that this dream is a test for the people. Test for your ummah. You see, Allah speaks of the dreams of the Prophet in the Quran. Once he saw a dream of the liberation of Mecca, Fath Mecca. And Rasulullah told his companions, we will go back to Mecca and we will return to Mecca. But we spoke about this in the sixth year when they were going, they were intercepted and they returned to Medina. So some of them questioned him. They said, Ya Rasulullah, didn't you say you saw a dream? Aren't you a prophet? Why are we going back? Rasulullah says, I didn't say we are entering this year, but ultimately we will liberate Mecca. Right? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala again speaks of this dream. In Surah Al-Isra of Rasulullah. Also speaks of the dream of, for example, the Prophet Yusuf in the Quran. An entire chapter that begins with the dream of Yusuf. Correct? So what does this mean? Does this mean that every day we wake up and we write our dreams and then we email 65 Maulanas and say to him, Maulana, this is the dream we had, please, what does it mean? First of all, let me tell you, I don't respond to such emails, so don't bother. I have people sending me emails, I saw this dream, it's three pages, and then please ask Agha Sistani. Really? It doesn't mean that my dream and your dream is of the utmost significance and importance. That's not what it means. Because some people will sit in the member and they'll, the whole time they're speaking about dreams. This guy saw this dream, that guy saw this dream, this lady saw this dream and the majlis concludes. Brother, why are you only talking about dreams? Because dream is in the Quran. Dream is important. Who told you? Allah speaking of the dream of Yusuf. Yusuf al-Siddiq. 
Allah is speaking of the dream of Muhammad Rasulullah. So what is he saying? He's saying that the dreams of prophets is part of their wahi. This is what Allah is saying in the Quran. Their dream is part of revelation. Do not question them. So Allah sends the 12th chapter to tell the Muslim community, just like the dream of Yusuf was a reality, the dream of Muhammad Rasulullah is also a reality. This is the, the philosophy behind it. Rasulullah comes and says, I have seen a dream. And this is in Tariq al-Tabari. This has been quoted and recorded by Al-Imam al-Zahabi, Al-Imam al-Siyuti, Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani, Al-Imam al-Hakim al-Naishaburi, the grand of scholars, the greatest of scholars, that he came and he said, I saw a dream. He stood on the minbar and he said, I saw a dream. And the dream is that Bani Umayyah have taken over my minbar like monkeys take over a, tr a tree. And Rasulullah was disturbed of this dream. And he was never witnessed smiling after that. I wish I had time to bring you all the books and all the evidence and show you page by page. How many times this recurring theme has come into account in the Muslim books of Hadith and Tariq by the greatest of scholars that tell you this was the most disturbing dream Rasulullah had. And he informed of his community. And more importantly, Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani, go read his biography. Ibn Hajar was against the followers of Ahlul Bayt. Ibn Hajar was far away from being a Shia. Ibn Hajar was a staunch scholar who supported and defended many Umayyah. He says, Rasulullah then said, listen, إِذَا رَأَيْتُمْ مُعَاوِيَ عَلَى مِنْبَرِي فَاقْتُلُوهُ O Muslims, if you see Muawiyah on my member, then kill him. Rasulullah informed, of, informed his community. There is an encounter between the wife of Rasulullah, Aisha, and Al Hakam. Ibn al-As, Ibn Wa'il, she says to him, I am a witness that when this ayah was revealed, Rasulullah cursed you, cursed your father and cursed you. She says to him, this is the wife of Rasulullah, Aisha says, I am a witness to that. That Rasulullah said, the shajar al malun is you, your father. And, and Rasulullah kicked away Al-As bin Wa'il out of Medina. Because he used to disturb Rasulullah so much. And he cursed him and his progeny which was Al-Hakam ibn Al-As. But Al-Hakam ibn Al-As became the fourth caliph of Bani Umayyah. He sat on the throne of Rasulullah, the, the, the successorship of Rasulullah. A person who was cursed by Rasulullah. Rasulullah says, if you see Muawiyah on my member, kill him. But Muawiyah became the Khalifa of Rasulullah. <laughs> and today, if you say anything, they tell you, brother, please don't create disunity. What kind of disunity are we talking about? He killed the companions of the Prophet, the family of the Prophet. This is disunity. We are just speaking of facts and history. Disunity and the ones who created disunity is the one who killed the Sahaba, who cursed the Sahaba, the one who killed the family of Rasulullah. Yes, indeed, when we want to understand Bani Umayyah, we have to understand them as the family tree that Abghadun Nas. Abghadul Nas, all the historians, all the scholars tell you Abghadul Ahya kanu bani Umayyah li Rasulillah. 
the most disliked people in the time of Rasulullah and during his life were Bani Umayyah. Disliked people to Rasulullah. He disliked them. Everybody knows this. This is a fact. Because they fought him. And they killed his uncle Hamza. And he knew that they were plotting against him and the religion of Islam. And when they took charge, we spoke of Muawiyah and killing the companions of Rasulullah. Killing the sons of the companions, the sons of the Khulafa. Changing the sunnah of Rasulullah. And then he gave the Khilafah to his son Yazid. And what did Yazid do? Muslims all around the world don't give deaf ear to Islamic history. And the first year he killed Hussein ibn Ali ibn Fatima, Rayhana to Rasulullah, in the way that the Muslim world knows. The second year he entered with his troops to the holy city of Medina. The city of Rasulullah. And they took over the masjid of Rasulullah. And they killed more than 70 of Hamalat al Quran, 70 people who memorized the Quran. And they took advantage of 1,000 Muslim women in Medina. Allahu Akbar. Inside the masjid of Rasulullah. Some books of history say when they would finish, they would wipe themselves from the book of the Quran, the pages of the Quran. This is the army of the Khalifa of Islam. This is their treatment of the masjid and the city of Rasulullah. And now there is a school in the Saudi kingdom, Yazid ibn Muawiyah. The school of Yazid, not Yazid. Yaz the school of Abu Sufyan, the school of Hind. A school named after Hind who, who ate the liver of Hamza Sayyid al-Shuhada. Imagine you send your, school, your kids to a school of such, named after such a person. What would the kids come out to be? If they don't come out to be Daesh, you'd be surprised, right? If they don't become ISIS, you have to be surprised. And the following year, they chased Abdullah ibn Zubair, a companion, the son of a companion, into Mecca. And they killed him in Mecca and they destroyed the Kaaba. But some people think they, they, they stopped. After the death of Yazid, no, come all the way to the year 120 after Hijrah. The murder of Zayd bin Ali, a shaheed. Forty thousand people. He had an army of forty thousand people on Kufa. They revolted against Hisham, and he. Ransacked them, he killed them, and many of them actually were given money and they loved him. But what did he do with him? He's in opposition, imprison him. You want to kill him? Kill him. They killed him. They crucified him on a tree. For how long? One day? Two days? One month? Two months? Six months? Four years? Naked, stripped away from his clothes, crucified on a tree, Zayd al Shaheed. And then whatever was left from his body, they burned it. Today, ISIS is more merciful than them. Wallahi. And it's the biggest injustice if we remain silent against this shameful part of the Islamic history. Those brutalities. 
And today, if you see brutality in the name of Islam and the name of Allah, no. That just stems from the spirit of Bani Umayyah, the akhlaq of Bani Umayyah. And remind yourself, brothers and sisters, you cannot call yourself the follower of Ali ibn Abi Talib, but have the merits of Bani Umayyah, and the akhlaq of Bani Umayyah, and the zulm of Bani Umayyah. This is why Hussein gave his blood to change this. So we cannot call ourselves the followers of Hussein and have the same merits and same akhlaq. We cannot do that. We cannot stand for that. We cannot tolerate that. And we have to speak of injustice wherever it may be. We don't pick and choose, say, well, this, this country is... We cannot speak about those countries we'll speak about. Those people we can't speak about, those people we speak about. Those scholars are, we cannot speak about, those scholars we speak about. Why? Because they call themselves Shia. No. If you see zulm and injustice, you have to speak. You have to have the bravery. And they, up until the year 132 after Hijrah, Marwan was the last Khalifa of Bani Umayyah, also known as Marwan al-Himar. Marwan the mule. Wallahi, I'm not making this up. Even if you go to Wikipedia, they'll, they'll tell you Marwan bin Muhammad, also known as Marwan al-Himar. Don't think that this is Qazwini, he's calling them mules. No. Now, whether why he was called Marwan al-Himar is a different story. Some people will tell you because he had the patience of a mule. He was patient man, so... You know, they, they've taken this title and they've made it into a noble virtue. The mule is patient, so we'll... But there is another reason why they called him Marwan al-Himar. Anyhow, Marwan and Bani Umayyah had created so much disunity amongst the Muslim Ummah between Arabs and non-Arabs and different civilizations and different groups. Until Bani al-Abbas gained power, and tomorrow we'll speak about the Abbasi dynasty, you will know the transition between Bani Umayyah to Bani Abbas. But they chased Marwan, he ran away from his home and his city, and he went and he took refuge to a church. They he thought they will not find him in a church. And he had a slave, he thought he was suspicious of the slave. So the slave he had, he cut his tongue. He cut his tongue. He cut his tongue and threw it to a cat. And then he, he was eating his meal. As he was eating his meal, the army of Bani al-Abbas came in. They took him. And the first thing he was doing, they held his mouth. He wanted to shout. They cut his tongue. And they threw it to the same cat. Subhanallah. Subhanallah, inna rabbaka labil mursad. This is where you know Allah is there. Where you see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he sat, the commander of Bani al-Abbas sat and finished his meal. This guy was just about to have his dinner. He ate a couple of bites. He couldn't finish the meal. He was killed. His tongue was severed. Then this... Army came, they sat and finished the meal that was prepared for him. And then this commander said, go bring, I've heard that this man has a beautiful daughter. She's known for her beauty, go bring her to me. She's going to be the first captive. The first prisoner, you've imprisoned so many people, now we're going to imprison you. So they brought his daughter and she was very beautiful. She told him, before you take me as a prisoner... And you enslave me, let me tell you a story. Just before you came, my father cut the tongue of this guy. And he threw it and this cat came and ate the tongue. And then you came and cut the tongue of my father. Know that Allah is watching. If you want to take me. So they said that he was afraid and he let her go. And amongst the greatest of crimes, the most vicious of crimes, that has stained the history of Bani Umayyah as the killing of innocent children. Children and infants. Allahu Akbar. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.